TLO, what's pop? We are on Twitch. We are live. But by the time you see this, we won't be. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notifications. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK, man. Right behind me, you see it. Little warning screen. H, appreciate the sub, man. You've been locked in for 14 months. Salute. Uh, like I was saying, though, man, right behind me, you see a little warning screen. Probably won't need it. Patreon, we post seven to ten times a day. We just watched Premier League highlights yesterday on there. It's always some of my favorite reactions. Don't forget, man, twitch.com is where you can't catch a live. Username's at the bottom of the screen. This is Lad Bible from SAS Soldier to Brad Pitt's Bodyguard. I've been really locked in on this SAS stuff. I ain't even gonna hold you. Them is some them is some elite dudes. I ain't even gonna hold you. But talk to me real quick. Copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. There we go. Billy Billingham. Hello and welcome to Extraordinary Lives, the podcast from Lad Bible. In this episode, we're joined by Billy Billingham. Great to have you here, Billy. Ben, it's great to be here. Thank you. Could you give us a brief introduction to who you are and what you're known for? Yeah, certainly. Um, I'm Mark Billy Billingham, better known as Billy. Uh, grew up in the West Midlands in the early 60s, 70s. Um, went a little bit rogue as a kid, getting in a lot of trouble. Found sort of direction with the military. I joined the military at the age of 17 and a half in 1983. Mm -hmm. Joined the Parachute Regiment. Um, where served in Belize initially and then all over the world with the Parachute Regiment for nine years, including three operational tours, including Northern Ireland. Um, from there, decided I want to go to the best place I could, and that was the SAS. I joined the SAS in 92, stepped out, and the first job... 92, so it only took him nine years to get to where he wanted to be. It, in the scheme of things, he was 17 plus nine, it was 26 by the time he got to the SAS, right at the beginning of his prime, for his body at least. We got in security, was uh, head of security for a number of A-list celebrities, including Angeline Jolie, Brad Pitt. Going from one side of the uh, camera, guarding people, to go on the other side of the camera and getting involved in TV. Mm. And up to okay. date now, I'm working on a TV show called SAS Who Dares Wins and Special Forces Toughest Test, which is the same version. People tell me to watch SAS Who Dare Wins, but it's with Channel 4, and mm, they're not very... I'm not watching it. As simple as that. But in America. I mean, that felt like it was about six lives that you described there, Billy. So we ain't started yet. I mean, <laughs> I'm excited about getting into them, but yeah. to go back to the beginning, you said there yeah. you went a bit rogue as a kid. So can we start there? What was childhood like for you? Right, so I was born in the West Midlands in a place called Walsall, into an absolute great family, actually. Mum and Dad... Um, Two brothers, older brother, older sister, younger brother, younger sister. I was the middle child. Mm. Mm, let's stop there. That middle child syndrome, that mid, being a middle child, do something to you. You know what I'm saying? You, as a middle child, you damn near forgotten about. You like you not really paid attention to almost so in some cases. So it's easy to go do your own thing and lose the path, lose the sight of what's going on. <laughs> My brothers and sisters were great. I just went rogue. I knew right from the early age how to manipulate and get away with things. And I played the numbers game, thinking, you know, do 10 bad things. If I can get, get caught by just one, then I've done all right. And uh, I really was. I was um, that kid that, you know, when your mom stands there and said, oh, he got in with the wrong crowd? Yeah. Well, I was the wrong crowd, and right. I knew it. I knew what I was doing. In the area where I lived, it was all gangs. It was, it was a poor area, you know, where it came from a poor family. Okay. Not to say that's an excuse, but um, so I started getting to gangs. And Pick even at that young age then, I had my own little gang and I used to steal Trilby hats. Right. And I don't know why I did this. It was crazy. To sell them or just? No, I just collected them because I thought it was cool. I wanted to try and make a name for myself. Because as I looked at all the kids in, around my area, you know, some of them had been in uh, 
Borstal and all that sort of stuff. And I thought that was the right way to go, have a name, be the tough guy. And of course, I was totally wrong. Um, so even from the age of nine, I just started stealing these hats. And me and my two mates, I used to, my mates would run in front of the victim, normally a 70 year old man, distract him. I'd run up his back, grab the hat, and run off. And then one particular day, this guy caught me. This old man chased me and caught me. And uh, I just went into a panic. I just went straight into a boxing stance. And my two mates had legged it, left me. And the old guy just stood up and says, listen, he said, there's something about you. Keep the hat, come to my boxing gym. And this is very, very true. You gotta, honestly, it's crazy. So I, I threw the hat at, at him, grabs the hat and he lets me go. But before I went, he says, look, the boxing gym is here. It was at a pub downtown in Walsall called um, Rocksteady Eddie's, or the Digbiff at the time. Uh, so I knew exactly where it was. It was where my dad drank. Right. But something told me to go there. Now, this happened on a Sunday afternoon in February. It's, it's crazy how one event can change your whole life, the whole trajectory of your life. It seems like this was that possibly one of those events for him. Now, Monday, I'm nine, nine, sorry, nine years old. I'm going uh -huh. to meet an old man that's mm -hmm. stolen from mm -hmm. at the bottom of a pub, at the back of a pub, who was supposed was going to teach me boxing. But I went. And it was one of the best things I ever did. He became probably the second most influential man in my life. So I went behind this pub. I met this old guy and um, absolutely bricking it, thinking, what am I doing? You know, nine years old. Imagine you letting your kid do that. Yeah. Seven o'clock at night, pitch black in, in February. So I go behind the pub, through the snow, Middle knock child. the door. The old guy calls me in. So I go inside and uh, I'm sh myself, but I follow him. And as I go in, I'm looking around. And I see all the little kids around about my age, all in there doing boxing training. So I've kind of calmed down and I'm going to jump forward a little bit here, but the old man basically took me to one side. He says, listen, I want to teach you about boxing. So I said, okay. He said, boxing is not a sport of brutality. It's a poor man's game of chess. <laughs> and I never forget these words. And this is very true, right? And he said, look, it's about anticipating what's in front of you, having respect for what's in front of you. To win a fight, you will win it with your feet and your mind, not your hands. And he says, it's That's when the facts. chips are down, it's about going that little bit further. Don't give up. Now, those words, I swear to you, right? I'm going to jump forward 20 years. I feel like that's real Floyd Mayweather-esque. Win it with your mind, not your, well, not your hands. I joined the SAS. When I joined the SAS, in the middle of the camp is a clock tower. One of the sayings in the SAS is, you have to beat the clock, which means if you don't beat the clock, your name goes on that tower, it means you're dead, killed in action like a lot of my friends are, unfortunately. Now, at the bottom of the clock, the last line is always a little further. Just like the old man had said to me when I was nine years old. And I've kept that as my mantra all through my life. Amazing. Do but you think yeah, he knew that about the SAS? At the no, he, he had no he, idea, no. mate. I mean, Constance. I didn't even know. I was nine years yeah. old. It was just happened to, it was just yeah. a saying and a phrase. And it was really like the hairs on the back of my neck that when I read, I went, wow. Yeah. Because I always remember those words from nine years old, you know. And from that age, I started to go really rogue. I was getting in a lot of trouble, thinking I was a tough guy. I was getting cut, brought home every other weekend by the police for whatever it was. At the age of 11, I had a criminal record. I ain't gonna lie, about nine is when it was for me too. It was getting peak. I'm telling, I think it's a middle child thing. Like, we have forgotten children <laughs> for a certain period of time. So the boxing gym didn't necessarily straight you on the straight, set you on the straight and narrow. It kind of put me on the straight tracks for a while. Yeah. It also taught me how to fight, which yes. made it worse, yeah. if I'm honest. But it gave me respect and it gave me discipline. And I was training on a Monday and a Wednesday, I think it was. So at least on those nights, I was staying out of trouble. Yeah. But then getting in trouble the rest of the time. You know, I knew, but I knew what I was doing. Yeah. You know, when people say, oh, he's just a child, doesn't know what he's doing. I knew what I was doing. But what did pushing. you want? What did, why were you doing I was that? looking for status. Right. I was looking to be like the hard guy in the town, you know, that, thinking that was it. Um, and then at the age of 11, like I said, I got a criminal record um, for ABH, GBH and whatever else that was. He was out there kicking air, kicking ASS. And then at the age of 13, um, and in between this, sorry, I joined the cadets. Mm -hmm. This is my first insight to anything to do with military. And I loved it. I love the way I was being tr treated, the discipline of it. You know, if you did something wrong, like in the old fashioned, he was, you got to clip around the ear mm -hmm. and put straight. And I liked it. Right. I enjoyed it. But what I also enjoyed was the fact that I was te being taught how to read a map. It made sense to me. How to do first aid, save someone's life. Again, it all made sense to me. All these things that I was learning. You know, a lot of people, <laughs> at least in America, they don't know north, south, east, and west. This is wild to me. If you get lost, you're cooked. 
That's, that's insane. Learning, you know, made sense. While I was in school, crossing the T's, dotting the I's, mm. learning, it made no sense to me. Mm. And I was still going a bit rogue. And at the age of 13, I decided to glue the maths teacher, Mr. Lynch, to the chair. So I put glue on his, thinking I was big. <laughs> Uh, of course, I get thrown out of, out of school, and ex he was moving like Bart Simpson. Spell from school at thirteen. And at thirteen, yeah. God. And like I say, my dad was a, a wonderful, wonderful man, but he worked twelve. In third grade, I broke my my teacher's nose. Twelve hour shifts. He couldn't really control me. Mm. And when he came Excellent. in after doing twelve hour shifts, mom went out doing twelve hours. So it's all difficult. And anyway, one who's a parent, anyway. You know, it is difficult to control your own kids. You can, mm -hmm. they, your kids can wrap around your fingers. That's what I was like. And uh, so, yeah, so I got expelled from school. I carried on doing the cadets. I carried on doing boxing. I was getting in and out of trouble. But I knew I wanted to join the military. I just knew it. That's where I have to go. But now I knew I couldn't join until I was 16 because I had a criminal record. It finished at 16. Ah. I thought that will be great. I'll keep my nose clean as best I can. And I was still getting in trouble, but I was, I was getting clever at it. I weren't getting caught as much. Then the age of 15, and things went badly wrong. I ended up in a fight and uh, with two guys, and I got stabbed. I got stabbed in the back. Jesus. At 15? At 15, How old were yeah. they? About 17, 18, I think. It's quite, it, for that. You must have been working them. You must have really been getting them. You must have been served. You must have really been putting them up on a dish. You must have been hitting them with the one-two combos for them to take it there. Age, that's quite a severe... Yeah. It, but like I say, this is the world I was in. Yeah. You know, we, it was a time of the skinheads and all this stuff. And although it had nothing to do with that music, music thing, or any, it was just a fight. I ended up in a fight and I got stabbed. So what, what happened? Like, where did that fight come from? It was just some falling out over... I can't remember why. We had some falling out over some gang issues or something. Mm -hmm. And I ended up on the embankment, railway embankment at the back of my house, fighting with the two... two they were brothers. Fighting with these two guys. And... Um, while I'm fighting with one, it was kind of, I was pushing him down the bank. The other brother came behind me and I thought he hit me with a brick in the back and then all lost all my wind and went lightheaded, fell to the ground. They sort of legged it and I ended up feeling around, feeling all the blood and realized oh, I'd been stabbed. God. And I crawled back to my house and I'll never forget it. You know that when you sort of, you've been kicked in the nuts and you get that <gasps> can't breathe feeling. I had, it was like that pain and I'm crawling back to the house. And as I'm crawling, I can feel the blood all running down my back and down the back of my legs and all on my hands, not knowing how bad I was. And I crawled in over the, through the fence to my house. And I remember crawling through the back door. I can see it right now. Crawl through the back door. And my mum was like mopping the floor. And she turned around and just screamed. Obviously, you could see I was covered in blood. But at that stage, I was going through the door. It, was, it felt nice. I was fl right. like I was floating. Basically, oh, I was God. bleeding there. Yeah. yeah, you were about to go meet your maker. The pain had gone, and I, but I can remember seeing my mum. Mm. And then the next thing, I'd collapsed. She covered him, got, got police, got the ambulance, and off I went to hospital. And I was lucky, very lucky, but I, and I recovered. But I remember lying in hospital saying to myself, Every SAS dude that I have seen so far in my little short-lived SAS deep dive, they all look like they are special forces. None of them look like they are accidentally here. They look exactly like he can go save a bunch of lives <laughs> that's exactly what they look like this dude look like he is one of them ones you know what i'm saying if i get through this i'm i'm staying out of trouble i am mm -hmm. doing everything i can to get into the military mm -hmm. and that's what i did i stayed out of trouble what i didn't do what i should have done has gone back to school i didn't i ended up getting a, a job in a factory in an electro plating factory totally illegal 15 years old and i worked on the night shift uh, 12 hour shifts earning 80 pounds cash in hand and electro plating for anybody that doesn't know what that is is um where you take like rusty old metal and stuff and you put it through a process of caustic soda sulfuric acid and then into zinc or chrome and it comes out all nice and shiny mm -hmm. so i started working in that and then on the night shift there was only two of us on and it was about two o'clock in the morning i had an accident basically the the older guy the adult who was working the crane that picks up all the work and puts it in these vats mm -hmm. of acid and stuff, went to the toilet and I thought, like I do, I could do that. So I jump on the crane, break it, and panic a little bit and think, shit, before he gets back from the toilet, I need to fucking fix this. So I jump up on top of the, the um, caustic soda right next to the yeah. sulfuric, no, sulfuric acid, sir. and I slip. 
And as I slip, I went in just to just below my knees, which for this day, I, I don't know how the hell I didn't go in because these vats are six foot. I shouldn't even be here. I should have dissolved. I bounced with agony backwards. And as I came out and sort of landed on the floor, the guy who I was working with came running back, saw what happened, grabbed me, ran me to the tap, pulled my coveralls off, ripped my Wellingtons off, turned the tap on, and all the water ran down my legs. And I came watch, watching it, and it just went in the layers of skin, and the skin just dropped off. Oh, and It was like just God. blood and bits, and it was stinking. It was painful as f Ooh, wee. And I thought, f I'm going to lose my legs. And in the panic, he grabs me, runs me to his personal car, throws me. You just was doing stuff when you was young. Like, chill, sit down. You know what I'm saying? Stab in the back, being so acid legged. Like, come on. In the back, and heads towards the hospital. Can't wait for an, an ambulance. But on the way to the hospital, I was lying on his back seat like a cricket, rubbing my legs together, absolutely yeah. in agony, you know. And all I could think about was, fucking hell, how painful this is, and I'm going to lose my legs. And as I pulled into the hospital, I remember I can see it right now, accident and emergency. I'm looking at it, and the pain went from my legs into my heart and my head, and I thought, I've just fucked up my whole life. Because mm. I'm now, now I'm 15 and a half, 16, I'm just about to join the military. And I've kept myself clean ish. And now I've got this injury. And I thought, Fuck, that's ruined my whole life. I'm never going to go into the military now because of these injuries. The injuries were quite bad. And it took nearly a year and a half to get them fixed. So I didn't get into the military. So while this was happening, every two weeks I had to go across to Wolverhampton Careers office to the medical, get them checked, check him away, checking all these things uh, before they'd allow me to join the military. I wonder if he still got the scars. So that's what I did, and eventually Probably. I ended up joining uh, the parachute regiment. Well, what's what's interesting there is like, it's amazing that you thought you were about to lose your legs, yeah. And the first thing you were thinking was, "I'm not going to be able to join the military." Like, where was this passion? Did, do you come from a military family? Like, where was the passion for joining the military? Why was it so strong at such a? I'll event? be very honest with you, the passion was staying alive. Right. I knew because of the way I was living, what I was doing. Self preservation. That's smart. At least that's smart. I'd have ended up getting killed. You know, I look back, I've been back to the area where I've, most of my friends are either in jail for uh, for life or mm. dead. Yeah. And I was going that way. I never got into drugs, but I got into, you know, I was going totally rogue. And I knew the military was my saving grace. I had to get into the military. And am I right in thinking that you actually made a decision? You, you got quite good at boxing, didn't you? Did yeah. you not have to make a decision between military and boxing? Yeah, I did. I was, I was boxing... Um, really from the age of nine from that yeah. old guy and then at the age of 11 he handed me over to a proper club and i never forget that it was like a real horrible moment for me i felt like the bloke that i respected has, has put me in the right and direction to issues. a degree was dumping me but actually right. he wasn't he was putting me in two because at the age of 11 you can box competition yeah so i then went to a proper boxing club and actually it was one of the best things i did the, the boxing club was fantastic so i stayed with them and you know i, I was boxing pretty well and i was on the verge of should i stay should i stay in stay with the Midlands and go professional boxing or do I join the military? But I, I kind of, my heart was in the military. Military, yeah. So I think the military side of it, all as, as passionate as I was to be in it, I don't think my dad wanted me to be in it. Mm. Wanted me out the Midlands, he wanted me to do something, but it weren't until the night before I joined the army that he really let his thoughts out. And I didn't realize to later on why he did what he did. And basically it was to give me a kick up the ass. Mm. My dad wasn't one of these cuddly, lovey yeah. dads. He was a six foot bruiser, but a great ringer still around our family. And he almost did everything to put me off it. Mm. Even, even to the point of saying, what happens if you go to Northern Ireland? And I went, oh, when I go to Northern Ireland, mm. back in the day, that's when it was a pretty much a hotbed, yeah. UK and on in Ireland, you know? People were getting blown up and killed all over the place. And uh, of course, as a soldier, you want to make a difference, try and stop that and, and be, you know, see how you react to it. Mm. And he says, that's great. What if you die? And you know, I'm looking at my mom and dad, and they're just staring at me, going, "Well, I guess you bury me, dad, don't you?" Mm -hmm. and went, yeah. Me and your mom, we bury you. So you can imagine how I went to bed that night, thinking, "What the? F I thought I was going to be proud of me of leaving the Midlands, gone away from the lifestyle I'd, I've, and the trouble I'd caused for the family." Well, you kind of got to prepare you for it. Maybe those are some things you wasn't really thinking about. But now you know. Now it's in your mind. Hey, get out here and stay alive. Use all your senses to stay alive. And do this. And I went to bed thinking, what the hell is going on? 
And I actually put it down to, well, I know what it was. I didn't, and I didn't find out till after he died, unfortunately, but it was to put that rocket up my ass of, he never really did the emotional thing with me, the lovey cuddly, love you sort of stuff. And uh, he wanted to try that, everything he tried on me, you know, giving me a slap, disciplining me, never stopped me doing what I wanted to do and getting, getting into trouble. He tried this to say, to when the chips were down, I was probably gonna throw my hand in and come out. It, it was that in the back of my mind to prove my dad wrong and stay there, and that's mm -hmm. what it was. So that po so you get the, you, the parachute ah, regiment, yeah, you okay. said, was the first place you went. Now, obviously to a young- It was like a light of fire under you, okay, yeah. Person that's about to join the military, I think that what a lot of people would think was the most important thing is being tough. And you must have been quite tough at that point because you've been boxing since you were nine. You yeah. had this incident with your legs that you'd sort of pushed through, recovered, not given up. Once you got in there, did you see yourself as quite a tough guy at that point? Were you thinking, right, I'll get in here and I'll be like, I'll be able to smash this? I'll tell you what, man, that's a great question. No, I didn't. I figured at that time I realised, bear in mind, I'd never really been out of Walsall. I was a tough kid around Walsall. Mm. We used to have the skinheads from Birmingham come over, Wolverhampton, Coventry, you know, and it got gnarly, got nasty, you know, getting in these scraps. But I thought, okay, this is all right, this is what it is. Then when I joined the Parachute Regiment at the age of 17, I, um, I'll never forget it, day one, standing on the square of 70, 70 people. And looking down the line, I'm still 17, I, I was skinny as hell, I think mm -hmm. I weighed about eight and a half, nine stone, because I've been boxing for years. Mm -hmm. And as I looked down the line, they all seemed bigger mm -hmm. and older than me. You know, all the big blokes, hairy chest, tattoos, moustaches, Scotsmen, Welshmen, people I'd never really met before. And I remember thinking to myself, what the f have I done? <laughs> I have not got a clue I ain't going to make this. Did you feel like a kid among adults? Yeah. I tell you what, I felt like a... That's the advantage, though. That's the advantage. When you grab onto something young, you can normally master it at a young age, and then when your body becomes fully adult, like 26, 28, like you in your prime, you already got it mentally on lock and all the procedures. Now your body and your athleticism and everything else gonna match up and you you know what i'm saying see see when you come into something as an adult especially like the military your mind gotta catch it you gotta unlearn a lot of things <laughs> you gotta you gotta unlearn certain stuff you gotta be broken down and brought back to adolescence minded you know what i'm saying so you could be taught the right way to do things you got the advantage. You coming in young. Hey, teach me. I don't know nothing. See? A, a very small fish in a big pond. Yeah, there. okay. And then stood in front of me was one of the most respectful people I, I've ever ever met was a, a corporal, my instructor, a scouser, um, scouser G, I'll call him. He, um, he had a fresh scar right across his face. He'd been shot in the face in the Falklands. And I never forget him from his only moments of speaking to us, just thinking, wow, that's who I want to be. Right. Respect that man. You know, I've, even I was proud. I didn't even know him at this stage. I'm proud of who he is, what he's done. Because we knew what he'd done. And I just thought, that's who I want to be. And I looked at these people again and thought, unless they throw me out, I ain't going nowhere. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give it everything I've got to get through this. And I had no confidence. You know, I was the skinniest, the youngest. The gobbiest for a short while, not for long, I tell you that. <laughs> and uh, but as the days and the weeks went by, the lines got a bit smaller and smaller, and the big guys were all falling out, and I was f starting a growing confidence. So this is the selection process. Yeah. For anyone that's listening that doesn't know, can you clarify what the parachute regiment does? Yeah, the parachute regiment are the uh, infantry. It's the airborne division or, or battalions of the infantry. It's probably, in fact, it is. It's, it's without a shadow of a doubt the best soldiers in the British military, other than probably the SAS. And I wouldn't say the SAS are better, we're just parallel to them and we work at a different level. Mm. Um, it's a very, very tough um, process. And as I said, 70 of us started that process, only seven of us finished. God, that's the- Damn. See what I'm saying? Coming in there as an adult, you thinking to yourself like, man, I could go do something else. I could go do this. I can go, you, it's, you can compare it to other stuff. Like, man, I don't gotta be. Coming in as a 17, 18 year old, you like, man, I don't know nothing else. I'm gonna just hold on, I'm gonna lock in. 
But really? Kind of, yeah, that's the numbers you're looking at. Over, but, how, how, over how long? Six months. It's a six month course, but there's a part on it called P Company. Yeah. Just like the Marines have their 30 miler there. Mm -hmm. That's their thing. This is three days of 10 tests, three, three tests on each day, except for the last day, which is four tests. And it's like a 10 miler with, uh, you know, 50 or 60 pound in one hour and 10 or whatever it is. I can't remember. They don't quote me on the numbers. Um, stretch a race, log race. It's absolutely 10 miles in an hour and 10 minutes. Horrendous. And I mean, horrific. And I remember when I did it, I thought, Hell, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> and on the log, when you do the log race, which is normally if you fall off the log, that's it. You're already automatically fail. Right. Um, the you fall off it as in if you drop the log. Yeah. This, the log, the log is a telegraph pole basically. Right. And the six of you, two at the front, two at the back, two in the middle. And it's, your on, hands are looped into it with a rough rope. Right. And that weighs a ton when, when you're running with it. And it's about a two mile race. And by the time we finished that, I think there was only three of us left on the log. And I was at the front and my arm was like the, like Stretch Armstrong by the time I finished. God. I remember dragging it over the line thinking, oh, that was horrendous. Could hardly breathe. But when, but when you're going through that selection yeah. process as a young guy and you're seeing these bigger guys from all over the country dropping out, was that making you think, God, this is really hard? Or was that making you think, okay, I'm still here. I'm still... Now, that's, that'll build confidence in me. Oh, I'm him. <laughs> I'm him at this point. That's a grown man with grown man strength. His mind just ain't there no more. Still here, they're gone now. It was a, it was a reality check of this is hard, this is horrendous, but growing in confidence, believing in myself, you know, thinking oh, I can do this. And when I did do it and, and pass P Company, although there's another, there's two more phases to it after P Company. P Company is the hardest thing, without a shadow of doubt, physically anyway. And it's. Um, you know, people get to the end, but it doesn't mean you've passed. You have mm -hmm. to get put in enough performance, given 100% to get, you, you have to get at least eight points out of 10 on every event. Now, and they don't tell you if you've done good enough or not. Yeah, so yeah. it's always playing in your mind. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that you're there at the end doesn't mean you're going to pass. And I'll never forget, be, there was, we ended up in the auditorium and I think there was about 40 of us, no, 30 of us started that by that stage. You know, most of them were already gone. 40 people had already gone. 30 of us that started it. And you go into this auditorium and the, all the staff are at the front and you just get your name called out. And it's like Smith. It's total silence. Smith stands up and goes, staff, fail. Staff sits down and you're all looking at each other going, he was and then Smith just gone then. Gone. Done. Yeah, and he just he was better than me in your head. And I'll never forget. Wait, did, so do they redo it or are you just out of there? And then my name gets called out, stand up, and I hear pass. And it was like I'd won the lottery. Bear in mind in school, all I ever heard was maths, Billingham, fail. English, Billingham, fail, fail. And then I just heard this pass and it meant more to me than anything in the world. Oh, you get the three fact tries. that I just passed, and I think I grew about six foot after that. <laughs> And I came out there thinking, wow, this is unbelievable. So yeah, they've failed. They, what happens to them is they, go, they get back squatted. They go back and do the whole thing again, or they get out. Most of them get out because that's, mm. you know, that's enough. But there are some that go back and do it again. Okay. And then when we got to the end, you know, you do that, then you go to Wales, uh, you do these military exercises, which is pretty horrific. You know, and again, that was in like freezing cold winter in the snow and the ice for two and a half weeks. Then you do your parachuting. And they make sure, they make sure, like a lot of these feel like, sound like physical feats, but like they make sure you're mentally there. Cause a lot of this is mind over matter. You know what I'm saying? And if your mind break, they're making sure you're strong-minded is what I'm saying. Been down at Bryce Norton, which is kind of classed as a holiday, but if getting front of an aircraft, <laughs> fully serviceable aircraft with a parachute on your back, yeah. you know, is a holiday, then that's what it is. But for me, that was the first time I'd even been on a plane. Right. So it was all new experiences. Yeah. And Never were, you, been... were you excited by them? Were you like going, this is I was excited, but I was also not intimidated. I, I was um, frightened by it, you know, because people get killed parachuting. And I never, I never even been on a plane. Like I say, the first day I get on a plane, I'm on this plane, this C-130, and... I'm looking at it and thinking, they saying what I'd expected. Yeah. There's wires everywhere. It's, it's yeah. raw. You know, they take off and then all of a sudden, you know, you've got this thing on your back that weighs almost the same weight as you. You get pulled to the door, stick your head out and you're like, the next thing, out. And you're like, out you go. <laughs> you're like, out, full. 
See, that's the one thing, man. When I was trying to go to the military, I was trying to go to the Navy. And I passed my ASVAP. Y'all know the ASVAP test. I passed with very high scores. I always was a good test taker. And it, it translated. I feel like the ASVAP was easy. My friend that went with me, he literally scored like a 10. <laughs> like a 10. I swear to God, I was like, bro, did you try? And I scored like a like a 80 or 90 or something. I forgot how it was scored. And I was going in and I was, you know how you go into something and it's entry level when it's military? I was going in one step higher than everybody, so I had like I was going in with rank because I passed it with high tests, and they wanted me to do they wanted me to fight fly planes for the Navy. Um, I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> but they told me that I was like, hey, y'all might have to chill on that. That I don't know about that one. I, I'm down for it because it sounds cool. But like them heights, man, I know I got to be able to jump out of a pair, like a, like I got to jump out the sky if something go wrong. I know y'all going to make me jump, try to do that. <clears throat> it's going to be rough. I bet y'all, y'all didn't even know this part about me. I think Twitch know, but YouTube definitely don't know. But yeah, I was in there. I was in there. But see, the only thing why I didn't go is because uh, I got kicked out of school and they red flagged me. But literally, I got kicked out of school with one month left. In high school, period, and I, I was pretty pissed off about it, but whatever. Only for this, imagine like I'd have a whole nother thing going on right now. Sky, <laughs> what the hell? And then you're like, as soon as you feel that pull on your shoulders after four seconds, poof, and it's open, you're like, whoa, then you're a king again. But am I right in thinking that you ended up becoming the champion cadet? I did the champion recruit. Like I said, there were seven of us finished at the end, and yeah. I was actually the champion recruit. And what does that mean? Does that mean just the top? It rank? means the best of all of the whole platoon. That's, that's amazing. Well, it was amazing, but I mean, I'm not saying I'm any better than anybody else. But they just said, said I was. I did yeah. my, the results. They were all good, great people. But for me, what a, what an achievement! Yeah, you know? standing there looking at my mom and dad and my old man, who actually didn't think I'd ever make it, and I didn't tell him I was a champion recruit. Oh, really? And no, did they announce it in front of them? My mom absolutely figured out, you know, she'd delight. My dad's like, okay, well done. Where's the bar? And then if we <laughs> jump ahead a little bit, so yeah. we're, so you've passed, you've passed now. Yeah. You've got through, you're selected. Yeah. What was your first, what was it your first tour? Or like, you know, what was the first experience of being sent somewhere like? Well, right. <laughs> this is true as well, right? Back in the day then, when I was in depot, you used to have these pay phones. You'd yeah. go into the pay phone and go, so I then pass out. Pass out means you've 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 finished your training. Um, I'm being pass out means you've 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 finished your training. Um, I'm being told I'm going to three para third battalion, the parachute regiment. There's three battalions: one para, two para, three para. And my uh, troops uh, platoon sergeant, who was from three para, he goes, "Great." He goes, "You're going to Central America." Mm. So I hear America. I'm going to America, mm. Belize. I didn't even think about Belize. I, I just heard Central America. Yeah. So I run, this is true, I run to the phone, ring my mum up, and I go, hey, mum, I'm going to three para. She goes, she didn't know what that meant. So I goes, great. I goes, well, where's that? Where are you going? I went, America, chicks, sun, beer, da, da, da. She said, wow, where about America? I went, Belize? She's like, you clown. <laughs> Belize is in the jungle. I went, oh. She goes, if you'd have done your job for Clean little reality check, wasn't it? In school, you'd know where you're going. <laughs> yeah. So I can go to America, but so that's where I ended up. I ended up in, in the jungle of Belize. And that must have been a shock. Oh, was it ever, mate? Yeah. I'd never been in the jungle, of course. You know, I mean, <gasps> all I ever knew about the jungle is what you see on Tarzan. Yeah. So I thought, right, okay, here we go. Yeah, and you go up to the battalion. This was this is quite a sad time in my life, actually, because I went up to the battalion, obviously, Keen, you went on leave for about two weeks, then you came back. And the battalion was already out there. Mm. So you go on to what they call rear party, where free para normally live in Aldershot. There's just a, a skeleton crew just keeping security of the camp. So we ended up doing that for a week. And I met a wonderful, wonderful guy there called Benny. And um, he was the only real adult that had spoke to me or us really nicely. You know, because mm -hmm. you go through training, you have to be shouted, screamed at and pushed to the limit. And, you know, you don't really get a rapport relationship with these people. And then he was the first person we had, and he was a great guy. He'd been to the Falklands, he'd done all this. And he was he was running the rear part, and he sat us down and goes, right, lads, listen to me. When you go up to the battalion, this is what you need to do. Keep your mouth shut. You ain't big guys. He says, listen and learn. Follow the people that 
are quiet, not the people that are screaming and shouting, because mm -hmm. they've got nothing to teach you. And he was absolutely 100% right. And he actually said to us, he says, I'll see you for the last couple of months of the tour anyway, because I'm coming out, finish the tour off, make some money, and I'm getting married, and mm -hmm. then I'm out of the army. Now, bear in mind, this is 1983, for, uh, beginning of 84, the Falklands has only really just finished. So everybody in the battalion really, except for a couple of platoons before me, had been to the Falklands. So mm -hmm. these were no nonsense people. They'd mm -hmm. all been to war. So I get out and join the battalion. And wow, it was like, I've never been away from home. I'm now the gobby newest recruit, not gobby anymore, but the newest recruit. No one's really talking to me. And it was a real tough time. And then being put in the jungle, which was, I had, romantic fantasies about what yeah. the jungle might be like. It was horrendous. It wasn't that. I know it wasn't that. Horrendous. Mm. You know, as a new guy, they give you... The romantic fantasies, my ass. Every time I think of the jungle, ain't nothing positive coming in mind, to mind for me at least. Now, I know there's some cultures in there that's living and, and some majestic creatures, but that's for them. That ain't for me. Romantic, my ass. You know what I'm saying? Mm-mm. The biggest gun. The anti horrendous. You know, as a new guy, they give you the biggest gun, the anti tank weapon, which you're never going to use in the jungle anyway, but they make you carry it. You got all this weight, all this water, all this kit, and you're at the back of the patrol and just following, just li trying to listen and learn. And the first couple of patrols out there, I was absolutely petrified. I remember day one getting off the helicopter, we'd only gone about 20 meters into the trees, put our burgers and wait for the helicopter to go, let, the, let everything settle, then you start moving tactically. Mm -hmm. I just put my hand in the side of my burger and this tarantula runs up my hand. This is like on... See what I'm talking about? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I would have shot that little mug. I ain't even going to hold you. A tarantula run up your hand. Absolutely not. Day one, hour one of being in the jungle. God, this big... Beastie things running and it's sat on the back of my shoulder and neck and I'm like froze to death thinking so I'll just shoot myself here <laughs> and the lads are just taking the piss and laughing yeah. at me like you know I'm like what the f somebody take the f off and then eventually some hard as nails blow comes just goes and sweeps it off with half my head and off you go again and you know this was my introduction to the jungle no one's I'm like what the uh, and at that point man, are you like brother like just to be a bit blunt about it like yeah. are you not scared of being killed as well yeah, you are. You're on at the time. I mean, this is the first time I've really ca ca carried live rounds. Yeah, with everybody else. And the reason we were doing that in 1984, there was still a skirmish going on across the border of mm. Guatemala and, and um, Belize itself. Mm. So there was we we're border patrolling, and the reason they were doing that mainly was because intimidation of the local populace to scare them out to either loot or steal or grow uh, and steal um, poppy mm. poppy mm -hmm. um, plants and, and drugs. Yeah. And also illegal logging. So the, it was real. Now, there was a couple of skirmishes. I per per personally wasn't involved in any where there were shootouts and a couple of people did get killed, you know, while we're out there. And it, yeah, it was dangerous. So it was all this new world to me. Grown men, been to war, carrying live rounds, and now intimid intimidated by the jungle, taking a while to fit into this group of people, which is probably rightly so, you know. So yeah, it was absolutely petrifying. Mm. And... The lesson the guy Benny told me right at the start was, you know, you get some people want to gob off and shout and you, you think, oh, he's a tough guy, I'll listen to him. And then you find out later on, absolute idiot, probably did nothing. And the quieter guys within the group who are sort of gravitated towards were the right ones who'd done it, been there and taught me, you know, and it was a, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And so the reason I mentioned Benny was because, bear in mind, I'm 17, yeah. you know, You know, I've... Damn it. I was muted. I said life lesson. It says you can use this in real world. I said when when you go on somewhere and you, there's a potential to learn, all the people are in there that are loud mouths, ignore them. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> go to the quiet ones. The quiet ones that have been there a while, they, they got you. 
seen people or been around people that had been killed growing up, but not to this extent. And then I remember one night, one day was in uh, at the, we, we came out of the jungle, we were at the base camp and all the alarms went off. And normally when the alarms go, alarms go off on the camp, there's a, a big problem. So I'm down by the rugby pitch and the helicopter comes in. The alarms have gone off, all the medical teams have stood to and I think, what the f is going on here? And the helicopter comes in and lands and they bring a body off. And it was Benny. And I was like, And I feel yeah, I grew up Benny. again that day. I was like, Jesus Christ, this is f***ing real. And he was going to get yeah, married. He was the one who was he finishing off and getting married. God bless him. Oh, yeah, and he, so, you know, it was an old well, baptism of fire, big learning Did curve. Did it not give big, you a... Were you not like, maybe this is too much for me? No, it, it just made me feel like, you know, I'm here for the right reasons. Nothing ever made me feel like I, I mm. wanted to go. Mm. It, you know, even the artists of times, they had to, they were going to throw me out. You know, I... R.I.P. Benny. I ain't f***ing going nowhere. Mm. I got a question, though. Like, in that situation, like, do you think Benny was thinking too far ahead? And lost sight of, like, what was going on? Or you just think, like tragedies of war it just happened maybe he got too comfortable in the thoughts that he was going home nevertheless r.i.p it just makes you think like you know what i'm saying mm. so i need this where does that come from because a lot yeah. of the people that we meet who would have similar experiences to you yeah or or the the sort of like military that we meet the other people would have had no choice but people like yourself mm. are willing to volunteer to do that where do you think that like what is that mindset it's it's just the want to do it and feeling you know i had a number of things whizzing through my head one i want to make a difference one mm. i want to i want to change my whole lifestyle instead of being known as this idiot this little scumbag that's causing trouble i want to be respected mm. so that was always there i did love what i was doing i love the challenges i love the fear of the unknown mm. i did you know you know the fact seeing people die and think well, that could be me. I kind of, half my head says that could be me. The other half says, no, it's not me. It's not going to be me. And I always believe that. And I've, since then, I've been in some. If anybody has any questions to why I'd be muting it, that's why. Horrendous situations where to this day, I still don't know how I've walked out of it. Mm. So I felt it was the right reason for everything inside me said, I want to be, I need to be it. And I was enjoying it. The hardships, you know, I, I enjoyed it. The hardships didn't, I kind of was, had a good foundation from it, from growing up. You know, like I say, we came from a very poor family. It was rough living. I friggin, everything was an hand-me-down. I hardly had any shoes until I was about 13. Mm. You know, it was a tough old time growing up. It was, so it kind of set me in the right set, but I just wanted to be there. So and I enjoyed think, it. It wasn't for money. It certainly wasn't for money. Because right. money in the army, sh Okay. Terrible. So do you think that, do you think that kind of like the mental strength, do you think it's something that's grown or do you think it, you start off with a wiring in a certain way that sets you on the path where you can develop into it? I think, you, yeah, you, you are born with a certain, you know, strength of mind and then you just develop it. It's, it's just believing in yourself and every situation I'm in, I, I'll say to myself, there's got to be a way around this or through this. Yeah. And there is. Well, I'm, there's proof I'm here. I'm fucking still here today, doing talking. So, you know, it's just never giving up. I, I just don't give up, you know. And it's just, it's grown with me. I don't like to fail. Mm. I don't get all, you know. I don't have a tizzy fit about failing. All that. Nah, me neither. Failing is a hard pill to swallow. That's why I just rather not give up. I'm trying to figure out a different route to get to, to, to the, to what I'm trying to accomplish. Because doing the same thing and expecting a different result is insanity. So you got to figure out different routes. Learn from it. I go, okay, I'll f*** that up. Shall I do that again? Or maybe that was such a bad mess. I shouldn't do it again. Or if it wasn't so bad, I'll go and do it again and hopefully get around it. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's always been my mentality. And I'd say the, the thing that you're, you've become a sort of household name for is the SAS. So yeah. what was the point where you've started looking at thinking about joining the SAS? And can you give people who don't yeah. exactly know how it all works, an indication of how tough it is to join the SAS. Yeah, I can. So this the biggest question that I had. What is the process? Okay, now we're about to get answers, okay? We're about to get how many? 19 minutes of answers. Basically, I mean, you don't know a lot about it when you join the military. Mm. When you go into the army careers, no one talks about the SAS. Right. You know, it's 
the SAS are a, a, what they call a tier one group, very, very small group of special forces. In, in UK, there's only two, two special forces. That's the SAS and the SBS. Right. Attached that, we have surveillance teams, which... But that's, Never heard of SBS. Okay. So there's S, SAS, SBS. In America, virtually everyone's special forces. Right. But they have a tier one special forces, which is Delta and SEAL Team 6, which is our equivalents. So... Okay, Delta and SEAL Team 6. See that's see that's what made that's what attracted me to the Navy because I wanted to be top tier. I ain't even gonna hold you. That's what, but hey, it is what it is. I had to go to a different branch and I didn't want to do it no more. They told me to, yeah, you can go to the Army. I was like, mm, I want to be a Navy SEAL and I'm good. <laughs> and if I can't get what I want, then I'm, we're not doing it. You don't know anything about that sort of stuff when you join the careers. You join the Army and all want to be like everybody when you first join the Army is be in the Army, mm. be in that unit. Then as you, you sort of grow and go through uh, experience and time, you learn about the SAS because you're always crossing over them somewhere around the globe. You hear what they're doing. Friends of mine before me had gone to the SAS. Now, I didn't really decide that's where I wanted to go until about seven years into my career. Mm -hmm. Good friends of mine had gone and I knew they're doing great stuff. I'd bump into them once a year somewhere having a beer. They never really said what they did, but I knew they were up to good, good stuff. And... Um, at the end, at the seven-year point, I'd been to Northern Ireland, operational tour of Cyprus, I'd been to Belize, so I'd seen some action, I'd done some stuff, and I thought, where do I go next? I'll tell you what it's like, it's, it's a, like, although I'm not saying parachute regiments low down, yeah. if you're a footballer, you start off in a, a particular team, mm -hmm. whoever the top team is, that's where you want to be, right? The premier, top of the premier team. Well, that's the same as the Special Forces, the SAS. You want to be, and, and I will tell you this now, that's not just in UK, the SAS, without a shadow of doubt, the best special forces in the world. Really? Fact. Fact. Damn, yeah, we, you know, most special forces we've ever fought against or fought alongside. Mm -hmm. And I know the special forces are like, wow, well, well, it's true. <laughs> we are, shadow of doubt, we are the best in the world. Fact. <laughs> so at some point, you know, most people go, I want to do that. It is an horrendous course. We all know that. So at the seven year point, I put in my papers because you have to. I want to be on the show that he wants to, that he's. Was gonna do SAS. Who dares? I would love. I would, as long as my if I. So I'm almost at my goal weight. I got forty pounds to go. If I can get to my goal weight, I'm doing. I would. I if it's still going on, I, I want to figure out. Put me on there. See where I can do. To volunteer mm -hmm. from the parachute regiment to go and do SAS selection. I then got told I've got to give another two years to the parachute regiment as an instructor down at the depot, which okay. is where I went through, you know, which was obviously a great privilege to do that. So that's what I did. And when I went down to the depot, which was perfect for me, you're fit as a fiddle. You're, tr right. you're running two ten miles a day. You're in the gym every day. Your navigation skills are great. Your soldiering is great because you're training. You're training the, the up and coming mm -hmm. new paratroopers. So that's what I did. So when I went down there, I knew I got two years of, of waiting time and prepare me to go on selection. So that's what I did. And then... Um, so that's nine years of service. Yeah. So, you're, so at the end, of, at end of the nine, 23 or 24. So it's still quite young, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, still young. Yeah. yeah, which is... That was the average age back then. Right. Joining the parachute regiment. Um, to, or 25, whatever. You'll have to work the numbers out. <laughs> but anyway, so... Yeah, that was really the average age. So between 24 and 27 to join the parachute regiment, to join the SAS. So I decided then, well, I decided at the seven year point, that's where I want to go. At the nine year point, they'll let me go. And I joined the course, uh, first course of 92, which was a winter course. There's two courses a year, winter and a summer course. I did the winter course, which is the, you know, a lot of people say it's harder. Some people say summer's hard, whatever. I would definitely say the winter one is harder, especially for navigation, because you can't see jack <laughs> over the Black Mountains. Yeah misses down you're in the snow whatever so i did that course and i turned up and i think it was 283 of us turned up and you're all stood yeah definitely 283 people not making it though on the square and it was just like going back mm. nine years when i was a young kid and we all do this it's like you know when you go for a particular job you look at everybody else and go wow he she looks smarter than me <laughs> got the kit mm -hmm. it's exactly what i was doing again now i'm stood at the end of the line of 283 people instead of 70 this time Going, he looks bigger, he looks fitter, they look better. I'm thinking... 283? Yeah, and I'm saying to myself, what the f*** am I doing? Yeah. Again, same thing. We, In fact, day two, 
80 of them are gone because you do a thing called a fan dance, which is the, the f that is the, 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 the filter for anybody who really shouldn't. What's the fan it, dance? It, it's a 24 plus kilometer f race, let's just say, over the top of the mountains. Right. Down the other side, carrying about 60, 70 pounds. Damn, day one you're doing that? It's <laughs> fast, fast as shit. And anyway, so you do you do the fan dance, and by yeah, the end of that, 80, 80 people had gone. You know, so the course is almost chopped in half already. And then again, day by day, week by week, the course. That's what your OG was talking about. Two two hundred and eighty three minus eighty is not half, sir. I don't. Even, is it? Is it? Not even close, right? Just gets get down and down and down and down. And that lucky number again for me, at the end of selection, which is six months, there's seven of us left. <laughs> yeah, so that lucky number again. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's horrendous. 283 to 60. I mean, to seven. I mean, that's crazy. The best of the best, literally. You know, there's a number of phases to it. The first phase is over the mountains. And it's, like I say, day two is... Uh, we lose 80 people and then every day the marches for a month get longer harder at night as well and you're on your own navigating and moving at, a, at i won't say what speed because i can't that's a freaking good speed and there's no let up it's relentless and is it are they when when people are dropping out is that because they're not successfully passing the tasks or is that because they're just going i can't carry on or like, it's a bit of both yeah. a lot of it is mind it, it comes down to mind, you know, you talk yourself out of it and you think, you. oh, I'm never going to make this now. It's always a mind test. All of this fitness stuff, yeah, you think it, the base, it looks like it's fitness, but no, it's a test of mind. <laughs> Especially, you're allowed to get what they call a red or you did back then. You could, you could mess up on one. You have to finish every march. Yeah. But you could be like 10 seconds over on one march. Oh, yeah. 20 seconds, maybe a minute. And they go, okay, that's a red. Next, if you do that again, that's it, you're done. Um, and most people just, do, you know, they just go over the time. Were there any points where you were like, F like you've Yeah, I had a few dramas like everybody else, you know, and, and I will say this, and it's, it's true, is when you do selection, you've got to be on top of your game, you've got to be fit, you've got to be able to navigate, but there is an element of luck as well. Mm -hmm. You will get injured at some stage, that's a fact. I had a few issues, you know, crossing the river one day in the mist and it was horrendous. I slipped in, I slipped on a rock, burgling on top of my head, nearly drowned, dropped my weapon. I was in the water for about 10 minutes, freezing cold, minus 10 or whatever it oh is. Oh my God. Trying to find my weapon, which had, I'd sl as a slip release and with the current moving so fast, it had moved. So I'm going down the river, found it. And I think that day actually was my fastest time on that march because I just didn't stop running. So if you turned up without the right- Oh my God. Is that you? Don't I, I don't think I'd ever left the army. I would never have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like the cardinal thing. Well, your weapon is a part of you. And gone back to the parish, right? Right. Yeah, I mean it's horrific. Right. I was literally going across the river. I'd only left the vehicle twenty meters, and the mist was right down. And the option was looked at my map. I either go eight hundred meters down there. There's a little bridge over, and then come back to go in the direction. I thought, yeah. I'm crossing that river. Bad mistake. Mm. Quarter of the way into the river, slippy rocks. It's about knee deep and the power of the river slipped. Head went over. The Bergen came on top of my head. I'm almost drowning. So in the panic of trying to stand up, I'll release the weapon. And now the current's taking it like yeah. only 10 meters. But you're trying but to... And in my head, yeah. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking, fuck, I've got to go back to that truck and stuff. I've lost my weapon, which I didn't lose. I dropped it. And then I got it. But as soon as I got to the other bank, I was absolutely frozen. And I just... Got my berg bearing and just sprinted, sprinted, sprinted. <laughs> yeah. no, I think I got gotta do a sprint, warm up the body anyway. The fastest time that day on that, but I mean, I needed it. Yeah, I couldn't wait to get to the end and get into some dry clothes. It was yeah. horrific. Yeah, so there's an element to luck, and then I think on the last march you do over that month, my knee was almost the size of my waist. I was taking painkillers, and I just thought I'm going to drag it with me, and I did. That was a time if I was not going to do it, was I couldn't do it. Well, your knee? Yeah, my knee. I twisted my knee. It was all swollen up. For the last two marches, it was agony. And I just took painkillers and just went. And the last march was about 18, 18 hours. It was horrific. And do they see that you're... Yeah, the ibuprofen, the hig, did, it'll do it for you. You know what I'm saying? In this pain, but then yeah, like, well, it's, it's up, up to you. him. It's yeah, up to you to, to say, you. that's it, yeah. done.
Right. Unless it's unless your fucking arms hanging off or something, mm. obviously medically, no, you're not okay. going on. So that was the first phase. Yeah, that's the first phase, which everybody thinks that's the phase. To, if you can get through the mountains, brilliant. Not at all. <laughs> the phase, the real phase of selection is the jungle. Right. It's horrendous. Now, I'd been to the jungle three times before I'd gone sure. on selection because I joined, when I joined the parachute regiment, I went there and I went to two other jungles since on training with the parachute regiment. So I went with a full sense of security thinking, well, I'm good in the jungle. I love it now. I'm happy with it. And phew, was I mistaken? Jesus Christ. And there's nothing special about the soldiering work you do in the jungle. It's just relentless of being watched all the time, under pressure, mental mm. and physical pressure. What people don't realise is the jungle in, in um, Brunei, where you do it, it's like being the Brecon Beacon Mountains, but with trees on top of it. Right. So under that canopy, you're going up and you're going down, and it's the horrendous heat all the time. It's 100% humidity. You're, you're soaking wet, you know, you're carrying... 100% humidity. Oh, my God. It'd be humid in Florida, so I can only imagine. And a lot of weight... You're being scrutinized. The, the staff don't shout at you. They yeah. ask you to do things and you make a mistake and you're kind of looking at them thinking, you just see them taking notes. Right. And it plays on your mind, you know? And then you've got the creatures, you're covered in leeches, you've got sores. It, it's horrendous. And you've got that now for five weeks. I, I'm going to come back to the yeah. same question, but that, yeah. that desire to do it. Yeah. I mean, I, I appreciate that it's probably not an easy thing to articulate to someone like me who just wouldn't be able to, if I had to do it, maybe, but the, yeah. the, the knowledge that I could just go, do you know what, I'm just going to go back to what I was already good at before in the parachute regiment. That's the easy spit. That's why people fail. Because it's all about self-motivation. Mm. If, if expecting someone to grab you by the arm and go, no, no, don't give up, drag you forward, it doesn't happen. It's down to you on selection because... Your work after that, when you're behind the enemy lines, there's nobody dragging you forward. You're on your f***ing own. And that's who they're looking for, that right, person. Right, okay, sure. But for me, my desire was, I actually thrived on it. I did, I really loved it. And seeing people falling by the way, so just gave me more strength again, thinking, mm. I can keep going, I can mm. keep going for this, you know. And trying to encourage people to do it with you in our little groups and that. You know, we, you try, but you see their weaknesses and it just gave me strength to keep going. So when you're in those processes, are you, th are you all banded together going, we can do this together? Or are you going, I've got to get through this, whatever you guys do? No, I mean, the first phase is individual. It's over to you. All those navigation things and those carrying the weights over the mountain is, is individual. Mm. You're on your own. It's, it's me. Now how, how sizable are these mountains? They gotta be huge. Nah, I mean, they gotta be a good size versus everybody Curious. when you get to the jungle then you're into patrols then it's teamwork mm. looking after each other but looking after yourself you know you've got to you've still got to make sure you're 100 percent. then you can give 100 percent with the patrol so it's that as well so they're looking at everything they're looking at you again still as an individual but more of what are you like under pressure working with anybody else and, and, and that I, sort of stuff so so that, so because they, they yeah because obviously they want you but they want to know that you are somebody that can be a team player i guess yeah so if you're if you're too set off on your own yeah. and not interested in anyone else no nah, it's ain't gonna work see so it's a delicate you gotta be like a wolf once again my favorite animal i'm i'm good alone but i'm better in a pack but i can do it alone if i need to you know what i'm saying but my teamwork is great. The balance then. It is. It, and, and I know exactly how it works because I went back as a DS, yeah, directing okay. stuff years later. So I knew exactly. At the time I was on selection, it's kind of all, all man for yourself, but teamwork when it needs to be teamwork. You know what I mean? You've got to know when to turn it on, turn it off. And, but then when you, you go back as a DS, I know exactly how it works. And what they're looking at is you. Mm. They're just looking at every single person as... Who are you? We don't care how big you are, how fit you are, what you look like, what you've had in the past. Stripping you back to the raw you and putting you through physical, mental, emotional pressures like I you've see, never... I said this earlier. I don't know, I know what they be doing. Being through. To see how you cope. Yeah. Can you think outside the box? Can you come up with a plan and an idea? Will you keep going? Will you try and find a solution or an excuse? As soon as you're looking for excuses... Done. You're done. Wow. And then, you're no use to us. This is like everyday life as a, as a living as a man, man. You're going to make it harder on yourself in everyday life if you make excuses for yourself instead of just figuring it out. 
Well, when you say there about the the mental and the yeah. uh, uh, the mental the mental journey and the mental fortitude, because one of the really I think famous things about the SAS, which I don't think loads is known about it, but it's the third phase. Which is, am I right in thinking? Because that's the interrogation, and can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the interrogation is it represents. You got to remember what our work is. We do work in small numbers. You do work individually. You are very vulnerable. You ain't got all the support around you immediately you know you're behind the enemy lines you're in the enemy's back garden mm. that's where you're working that strategic level of working you know and it's dangerous scary shit. um so you've got to be able to, to stand on your own two feet now the biggest vulnerability of being out there on your own even in a small number you're always outnumbered if it goes wrong it's going to go wrong big star mm. and the worst case you can f end up in is being captured not being killed, being killed, it's done, isn't it? It's over and done. Yeah, but captured. being captured. And then you got to deal with, what's the torture, maybe, possibly? So what they do, there's a phase that sort of tries to prepare you for that, of how to survive under captivity, how to escape captivity and being evade. You know, so that phase, uh, escape and evasion, is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So we'll always start with learning how to survive and live off the land. Worst case scenario, being on your own how to navigate from the stars, from nature, all those raw skills that you need to know. Because inevitably, when it does go f tits up, you know- He's you gonna talk about who dare wins and and this, I, I think I'm gonna skip over it though, because it's been canceled, right? It's been canceled and Channel 4 was making them stage stuff after series two, so it's, it's like irrelevant. You probably ain't gonna have the life support you had with you, your burgundy may have lost, mm -hmm. or, you know, you've had to run without it, mm -hmm. your equipment, so you're, you're literally as raw as it can be. So you do, you get taught all those skills and how to survive and all that sort of stuff. And you've already done quite a bit of it through the phases, but then they really intensify it. And then at the end of it, you know, you go through a phase of learning how to, if captured, how to represent yourself, to give yourself a chance of living building a rapport with the enemy enough to keep yourself, one, to find a way of escaping, or two, hoping that the Jedi's are gonna come through the window at some mm -hmm. stage and f***ing save you. So you're trying to pro prolong your life by building a rapport with these people. So that phase is where you get interrogated, stress positions, and it is horrific. It's horrible. However, you know, everybody has a different experience. We're all different inside the mind. Again, for me, I wouldn't say I enjoyed it. I didn't enjoy it. It was horrific, but I just knew they ain't going to kill me. <laughs> sure, okay. You ain't going to kill me. But when you say it's horrific, what does that look like? In right, right. <sighs> no. I mean, we need more. I won't say how many hours it sure. is that you do it because I'm not allowed to, but it's a hell of a lot more than what you see on any TV program. Right. It's a, The stress position. Yeah, is. you're in these stress position. I mean, if I asked you now just to stand up straight, then bend your knees, half squat with your arms in the air. Yeah. After about two minutes, you'll you're gonna, you'll be like this, trembling. So you're like that, you know, and the, you're there for hours, for hours. And then, you know, the, the, you've got a guard force that's got total control of your life. So that's really messing with your mind. You can't piss, you can't talk, you can't move. Somebody else has got control of your life. You just think about it, it's, it's horrible. And then you've been put in these horrendous positions that like your back's killing, you think your back's going to snap, your shoulders are hanging off, your arms are hanging off, just holding your head up. It, it's just... The worst of, of everything. Mm. You want to die. You're like, well, you're actually praying to be interrogated because at right. least when you're getting dragged in and being screamed and shouted and mentally, you, you, your arms and your backs in a better oh, position for a right. bit, mm. and then by the time they're screaming and shouting at you and dissecting you, and then you feel your mind starting to struggle, you're hoping to go back for a stress mm. position, mm. so you're bouncing between. The, but it's a long, long process, and not, a lot, a lot of people do fail that. Yeah, that seems like that's 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 a uh, uh, that's one of them points where it can get over where blah, blah, blah. those are one of the tests where a lot of people lose it's a, you're done for that seems difficult very difficult but if everybody's different again for me I thought you ain't gonna rip me to tell one else out yeah in reality they will <laughs> in reality this is gonna this it's gonna be a lot worse than what I'm getting here but that process of when, when you do it, you just keep, I, I just keep saying to myself, this is just a game. Mm -hmm. but you start hallucinating. Bearing in mind, before you get captured anyway, you've been on the run for yeah, two weeks. Course. 
you you know you sleep deprivation food deprivation you're absolutely exhausted and then you got somebody just ragging you around <laughs> who's just got total con you know don't, not even being able to get for a piss yeah it's not like you see on the tv you put your hand up and ask for a piss that ain't gonna happen no you know, if I slap around the head and but then like you say it's what it's preparing you for is a reality yeah. that would be a lot worse if it was ever yeah. you, you, you're preparing yourself you're getting an insight an idea of what it's going to be like when you are working and, and, and you so seven of you yeah passed yeah which is I don't know what that is as a, as a percentage down from 283 was know. it but yeah I mean they all say that the regiment's the 1% of the 1% that right, want to do it you know so you. and then once you get in to the SAS. Yeah. How different was it in terms of workings from the parachute regiment? I, I love that you asked me this, and I have told this a lot. If you've heard it, I'm sorry. But so when I joined the SAS, right, um, you have this expectation what's going to be like. Yeah. Of course, a couple of friends have gone before me, and I know what they're like. They were really fit, they were strong, they're big guys, doing great stuff. So when you get to the end of selection, in my head, I'm thinking, right. These are going to be super fit, super crazy people. If I said to you guys here now, I'm going to bring in five SAS guys, most of you would be thinking, okay, big fit, mm. V shape, uh, you know. That's kind of what you get. You just think that image. I don't know why everybody does it. Even I did it. I don't. I don't. You got to think about it. All the exercise, all the, all the cardio that's being done, like, I don't think little big dude can, like, stomach that muscle it takes a lot of oxygen to feed muscles you know what i'm saying so i, I don't think that i think there'd be like a a lot of core strength a lot of maybe smaller not not unfit but like thinner frames you know what i'm saying but definitely they look in the face sas ish so when i got to the end of selection i got got told right and there's no big celebration there's no parade, there's no nothing else. Right. You're just there. You know, the regiment of Sergeant Major comes in, the commanding officer goes, oh, okay, well done. You've all got to the end. There's your berry, there's your belt. You're going to B scoring, you're going to D scoring, you're going to Mountain Troop, A scoring, whatever it is. And you're like, great. You don't care, actually. You don't want to pray. By the time you're just glad to be alive and be at the <laughs> sure. fucking end of it. Yeah. So off you go. And I go across the B squadron, um, which are the guys who did the embassy years ago. You know, they're oh, the yeah, first yeah. ones you ever yeah. heard oh, yeah, about. Great that, yeah, squadron. Yeah, yeah. They're all great squadrons, but B's better. B is better. <laughs> so you got a B squadron. I go to B squadron and they're all in these, their own little sort of um, areas. We call them interest room uh, where everybody hangs out. And that's where you sort of, you know, you all meet, you have every morning, decide what we're doing, what training we're doing, what operations are going on, all that sort of stuff. And then that's how it is. So I get sent to B squadron, mounting troop. So I've got my berry, I've got my bell feeling proud, you know. Off I go, walk into B Squadron interest room. And as I walk in, I'm like, am I in the wrong f place here? I thought I walked into a council office in Hereford. <laughs> right. I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? It's like, fat bloke over there, bald headed bloke over there, skinny bloke over there, already got any teeth. I was like, this is the SAS. In my head, I'm thinking, I'm, are you kidding me? <laughs> There's these. People misshaped all sorts of... I'm thinking, what the f So they had some bad bodies in there? White body kit bodies on there? Dang, that's tough. Yeah. Just joined. So I'm a little bit bewildered. But they probably been in there for a minute. <clears throat> they chilling. Bewildered, to be honest. I mean, I was quite fit. I was skinny, but I was... Because I'd just come through selection. But I thought, what is this? There are some really fit dudes there, of course. There's all these different shape of mm. people, and there's a big guy, and I think I can call him fat. Big fat guy making a cup of tea, and he sees me like looking in shock, and he turns around, he's making a cup of tea, and he looks over to me, and goes, "You right, son?" I went, "Yeah, I'm all right." You? And he goes, "Yep." Yeah. You want to go for a run? And I thought, he, the "Fat guy's asking me to go for a run." I thought, <laughs> "Yeah, I can fucking run, mate." We went out the gate, right? I saw the sole of his fucking boot for about thirty meters. I never seen him again. <laughs> <laughs> he had to show you something. He said, "You in here looking like, I, well, like I'm, like I'm, I'm, I'm big because I'm making this tea. Let me come, come outside. Let me show you something. Let me get up with you. That's tough." So I get back to the interest room, and he's already had a shower and, <laughs> and, and doing. A, and I'm like, "What the f is this?" And then the penny dropped. This is a marvel. This ain't about image. Real. This mm. is about what is there. Mm. 
And that's why I remember on selection, certain people passing, certain people not passing and thinking, it really is about what these people have got in there. Mm. And then day two or three, I haven't been there long, an operation comes in, a job. This bloke walks in with a rolly and he's smoking and rolling, flicking on, and I thought he was the guy going to clean the bins. It's yeah. a sergeant major. And he goes, right, issue, there's a, there's a operation going down, you know, we need to be in a place, save these people's lives, whatever it was. And he's gone, let's do it. And I thought it was a joke. I'm like looking around going, what the f is going on? And then I watched these people put this plan together, all sat around, no, you know, just talking, boom, boom, boom. And the next thing you're off, bang, doing this operation. And it was like, wow. What the uh, and are they bringing you in at this point? Yeah, yeah. They, yeah so I mean, yeah. At that, and the song major's like, sorry, what's your name, son? And I went, Billy. Yeah. He went, all right, welcome, Billy. How are we going to do this? Right. Asking me, and I'm like, <laughs> I've, I've just turned up. Uh, you know, but that's how they are. Yeah. And they expect you to have something to say. There's no rank, there's no class. It's, you know, there is rank. We all know who's in charge. They don't wear the rank. We know that guy's a, the, the main man and he's this and that. He's the patrol commander and he's the troop staff. He, he and does it learn. still have the hierarchy in like, the way yeah, you think? Yeah, he does. It does, but and... to be honest, the, 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 the operational side of it is run by the guys. The officers generally, the younger officers get involved because they're new as well. They're still, they're learning and they get fed into it. The older officers, the old season there after, they're the ones who do all the planning at the government, planning at the op, uh, embassies around the globe and that side of it. So all the groundwork really is done by the blokes. So yeah. from Sergeant Major down is where it really happens. Okay. And yeah, and just, it was just, so I was like, oh, so all of a sudden this whole new world opens up to me. I think for the first eight months, other than one or two times when we did, I didn't even wear a uniform. Right. I was growing my hair and I was in places around the globe I'd never even heard of. You know, I was learning a language I didn't even know existed. And then next thing, I'm speaking in this foreign country doing surveillance type stuff and whatever. So, so once you joined the SAS, yeah. obviously you're in like an amazing physical and mental yeah. position. But were there any per, were there any points where you were like, I think, I think I'm good. Like, were there any points where you felt close to death? Any that you can talk about? I know oh, a lot no. of stuff you can. Good question. Every day, right? Oh. Sure. Well, is that how? No, is that how intense I mean, it is? The way you train. Yeah. You are. You know. You, you're side by side rounds going past your ears to the, in the dark. Respirators on. You're throwing yourself out an a, a aircraft at ridiculous heights. You know, through the night with all this equipment into the ocean, you're constantly training, real, realistic, dangerous training. We do lose, unfortunately, people mm. in, in training, training? And, and people badly injured. And then operationally, yeah, freaking hell, you know, from the Bosnia days to Afghan to Iraq, close to... I'm not even going to lie, that wasn't even a thought in my head, people passing away in training. That's, that's, that's different. Even being shot or blown up or both regular mm. regular you know and like i say it's that, funny because you, you just right. get on with it you just kind of get on with it and, and, it's, and it's funny because when the blokes get together you'll have a beer and they go they look at each other and go how the f did you walk out of that mm. and it'll be a certain operation where somebody's nearly blown your head off mm. or had the drop on you but somehow you got out of it or a particular bomb's gone off quite closer, but it's all been impacted by a vehicle in front of you or whatever it is. So there's all these crazy stories that you get involved in. And yeah, it's, it's at times when you get a bit, you forget about most of it, but a lot of it, I say you forget about most of it, you do. There'll always be something that'll trigger yeah. in my own mind of, oh, I remember that time. You know, and I'll give you one example, which I don't mind talking about, was we were in Bosnia and um, real weird situation, actually. And it wasn't, well, I guess it was, it was dangerous. It was dangerous. Okay, of course it was. Okay. And we had an interpreter with us. There's only two of us and we're on the ground. And we're trying to find our way through to the front line because out there it was a mess. You know, you had Serbs, Croats and Muslims all fighting each other. <laughs> mess. And then in between all that was minefields everywhere. Mm -hmm. We were trying to figure out exactly what, who was fighting who, when the next thing was going to happen, all this sort of stuff. And we had, there was two of us and we had an interpreter with us. And the interpreter was a female, local. So she came with us, she was ballsy as hell, wonderful, wonderful girl, absolutely nails. We're obviously sneaking around, nobody knows who we are, what we're doing. And we end up trying to find where this front line was, where the, the main fight was taking place this particular time. We end up in this frigging minefield, and we didn't know we're in it until we're halfway through it. 
So we're now lying amongst all these mines. So now we've got to either get out as best we can without going blown up or continue with the task to do what we want to do and then get out. So we decide we're going to continue with the task and we get through and we end up overlooking this village and this village is getting smashed and it's like a film set. Mm. Houses on fire, there's gunfires, people fighting in the street, there's people hanging out of cars, dead, there's bodies everywhere and we're watching it from across the, this position, you know, probably about 800 metres from it. The interpreter is with us. And she was wonderful. She was used to all this. It's her area, it's her, her country. And she had a little transistor radio. So me and my buddy are watching this, trying to make sure we don't get blown up and watching and reporting what's going down and trying to do what we need to do. And she says, okay, I'll play the radio. And we're like, well, there's bombs and bullets going off. No one's going to know who we are. So she, I said, yeah, no problem. So she puts her little radio on and she's behind us. And we're watching what's going on. And Hotel California comes on, the song. And I can hear this song, and you're kind of saying it in your head as you're watching this horrific thing happening in front of you. And then my mate nudges me, and I was like, what? He goes, behind you. So I look at our interpreter, and as I look over my shoulder, she's in floods of tears. And in my tiny, stupid head, I think, oh, that record obviously reminds her of her boyfriend or something. So I turn around to her, and I said her name. I says, hey, if it's upsetting you, just turn it off. And she went, no, Billy, that's my house. I was like, I just wanted to roll over onto a mine and just f***ing end it. I thought, oh, my God. You know? God. It was just horrific. But trying to paint that scene, what I'm talking about, literally, it was her house getting smashed on fires, people screaming. And I was just, hey. oh, And you're in those situations all the time. So we carry on doing what we're doing and quickly get out. But my point of saying that was, there's certain things that'll trigger certain things. And that song just reminded me of it. You know, or a smell will remind me of a certain situation in another country where phew, where so-and-so was killed or that happened or this happened. Are you, yeah. There's things that you, I mean, that's sort of an amazing story. Like yeah. just, but the, but it reinforces like the stuff that you do, like the, the stuff that all people in the military do. Mm. But then when you're saying the 1% of the 1%, there's things that you guys do that like civilians just wouldn't be able to process how it feels to do it. No. How do you get to the point where you can like? Can you process these things indefinitely, or do they start leaving at all? Like when you talk, when you're, you know, doing operations that will probably end other people's lives. That's something most humans never do. Most yeah. humans never take a life, and a lot of humans have a very limited exposure to death as well. Yeah, people like yourself will have a high amount of exposure. Is there a way of protecting yourself against that, or is it? Are you on a sort of countdown to it starting to having a no, I think we kind of alluded to it earlier. Every single person's different. Everybody's mind's different. You know, we're talking about comments about. Uh, I sometimes can't get my head around how people give up on the interrogation so quick and all that stuff. Mm. But we're all different. So tolerating, not tolerating, but dealing with what we do deal with: death, destruction, almost losing your own life, or losing your mate's life, your mate losing his life next to you. You, you go through a massive process in your own mind of feeling guilty. Could I have done this, should I have done that? Yeah. Would that have helped? You blame yourself. You feel um, like you've let yourself down. And, you know, so you go through all these emotions and whatever it might be and the situations, and you always ask yourself one thing is, could I have done a better job? The truth is, probably not. And the other thing is, it's already happened. Mm -hmm. right. So you've just got to sort of process it and move forward from it. Now, the way I, I've never had... A, a mental problem. Mm. I'm, so he mean like, do it and don't think about what you could have done differently because it's already done, can't dwell on it. Like next day type mentality, or next play type mentality. Or whatever. Just lucky or fortunate not to have had any issues with it. Like I say, I have my moments, I have my dark times, but I just sort of, I don't know, I just get on with it. Mm -hmm. Now, Will I be the same in five years' time, ten years' time? I don't know. There he might sound, be something that triggers something that I can't... He sounds like a Gemini. ...handle anymore. But right now, I think by talking a little bit about it, and especially talking with the people that we should be talking, peers who yeah. know what I'm talking about, because it's like anything as well, you know. <clears throat> and um, while we're on this subject, especially with the military, I don't think we used to handle it very well. Mm. People that had been... We'd had some bad situations at times, you know. And you just come back and just be expected just to 
go home for a couple of days and then back into work and off you go again. There's mm. no decompression or nothing. And I think that has stemmed to, to a lot of the problems that we're having today. So you're in a kind of right. you know? constant state of reflection and processing, like little and often, would you yeah, say? Yeah, yeah, little and often, yeah. Okay. You know, have you got your remembrance days, certain, especially today, social media, there's always, yeah. every other day, somebody will put, you know, God bless us, I would rest in peace, I did it, you think, oh, I remember that, I was... But then there's the other sides of it that we've walked away from, where we've all walked away yeah. from. It's, it's kind of funny, but there are times I've got, F hell, I've had chills on my back. And how the hell did that happen? How mm -hmm. did I just walk away from that? Somebody your distance from me trying to blow my head off and missed with six bullets. How the f did that happen? Has that happened? Yeah. God. And I'm like, how the f did that happen? <laughs> to this day, I still don't know. <laughs> Stevie Wonder could have done it. <laughs> <laughs> We might want to so those ones we do, yeah. <laughs> so you just put those ones down to look. Yeah, you know, it's just yeah, and it's God. well looking and like I've always said, it shouldn't have happened, and it didn't happen. You know, and blokes have said to me, "How the f did you walk away from that?" Well, and when somebody puts about six bullets between your neck, your neck, your chin, literally down that line there, where your arms are, where your weapon was, but and didn't kill me. And missed it. He didn't get a f second chance. That's for sure. Yeah, Talk I mean, about that, that's all sort of scenarios. Took you know, him you out, go, didn't you? you relive them and you go, bonkers. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it make, it's certainly <clears throat> bomb dropping that side of the car. And the whole, you know, have you seen that Ali G thing where he stood against the wall and they open up on him and it goes all Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he's obviously got his <laughs> like a thing on funny it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we've had a situation like that. A mortar bomb has landed that side of the car and it's hit it and the whole thing is all around. <laughs> like, what the f***? How the f*** did that just happen? God. You're like... Yeah, the host looks mortified. <laughs> so, I mean, but basically, Billy, you're someone that, like, you've got so many aspects to your life that it's like, you'd you'd want... you. I think we need four hours, five hours. I know that one of the things that we want to get onto is the celebrity bodyguard stuff. Yeah. And so, I guess... Because that's a fascinating thing, because I guess that's not something a lot of people do, is it, when they leave the military? A lot of military do get into security. Um, not a lot of them do it at, at that level. Yeah. You know, I was, I was just fortunate to be in a place to be asked to go and do it at that, at that level right from the, the moment I stepped out of the army, to be honest. But Brad Pitt and Angelina, because yeah. they're like two of the biggest apples on the tree in terms well, of... Well, they were on the, in yeah. the day. When I, when I did that job, they were. I mean... Prior to leaving the military, you know, I, I, I always say I did 27 years. I did more than 27 years because you do, I stayed on a thing called, um, well, the reserves. I did five years of reserves. Okay. I didn't really do anything at all. So I never really count that anyway. Okay. But in all that time, when I left, I had, I had to find a job. Right. And the hardest thing about that was, well, firstly, finding a job. But too. secondly, you know, you spent, or I'd spent all my life yeah, you denying who I was and where I was because yeah. that's what we do. Yeah, we have to, you know, we're not even on any registers anywhere or anything. So that's our lifestyle. So we've, and then all of a sudden that career's over, you got to go to work. Mm. So what do you do? And then I get offered a job security and it was for work. Brad and Angelina. I feel like I should have some type of pension or something that is for who was at the time with the biggest A-list list on the planet. And he's good pay, I needed work, and I thought, well, I'm gonna take the job. So I took the job, and it was really awkward. Because all of a sudden, f hell, you know, I've gone from nobody knows who the hell I am to all these, like this, cameras everywhere, and mm. people, who's this new bloke, who's that? You know, it was really uncomfortable. And I was kind of one foot in the water, one foot out the water. Am I doing it, am I not doing it? And it was just, it was awful. Being shot at with a camera as opposed to a gun was worse than f ever. Is it not hard to come out of something like the military and then if you're bodyguarding people like that, is it yeah. not hard to even have a conversation with people like that? Because if they're going to you and going, oh, can you get the vegan food in? And you're, are you not going, do you get what I mean? Like, yeah, no, I understand exactly. And that's a good point, Ben, actually, because I was going to allude to that. So the first, you know, firstly stepping out into this new world, cameras everywhere, in the limelight, on every magazine that's going, and I've been done. And then down to, yeah, can you make sure that my stuff's at the dry cleaners by yeah. And the driver's got the, you know, like, you're like, what the f are you talking about? Yeah. But you, you soon adapt. You soon go, you know what? And you actually, I started to chuckle about that shit. Right. Yeah, can you make sure the sushi's got California rolls? And I'm like, do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you do, you kind of, you get used to it and you start to enjoy it. It's about, to be fair, all the skill sets that I had in the military, 
it's a you've got all the skill sets you need outside mm. you've just got to tone it down and adapt it to what it really is it's finding out what it really is right. you know and as soon as i realized once i'd stopped worrying about me being caught on camera me doing this mm. i could really concentrate on the job and what is the job the job really yeah because you on camera back then during the job it was irrelevant the camera's not for you <laughs> it's protecting an image Mm -hmm. That's all you're really doing. Mm -hmm. You know, 90% of it. Of course, you've got to be physically there. You've got to be aware of lunatics who might want to have a go at them or want to, you know, kidnap or whatever. So you've got to have that in your mind. Whereas the life before, it was all about that. That was the priority. Death, kidnapping, killing, whatever it is. Now it's making sure they're not stood in front of a camera with coffee down there, mm. white shirt, or say the wrong thing when they're drunk. You know, that, that, so it was adapting that to... Babysitting, really. Mm -hmm. It's like glorified babysitting. You and know? is the threat level there? Is it present? There's always a threat level there. You yeah. know, everybody wants 15 minutes of fame, don't yeah. they? I mean, look at John Lennon. Yeah, yeah. Somebody will have a pop whenever, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember Tom Cruise, who I'd looked after Tom a while, but and, and it was after I looked after him, thank God. He was walking the red carpet and somebody pulled a, a pistol on him. It was a water pistol. Right. Yeah, it was a water pistol that, that time, but that could funny. have been a pistol, mm. you know. Somebody did that And fired time? water into his face. That could have been acid. So if you, people, so there is a threat there. There are, there are, they're not around every corner, but you have to have that in your mind. Mm, you can't most, get complacent most, with yeah, it. Yeah, don't yeah. get complacent. But yeah, there is a threat there. And you, you did, you did quite a few of the big names. Didn't yeah, you? I did. Yeah, I, um, I did a lot of moonlighting. If I'm honest, I looked after Hulk Hogan, which I, I fucking loved. Hulk Hogan. <laughs> <It's funny>. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I looked after Hulk Hogan for a little character, just for two nights, I think it was. But it was funny. Yeah. And the thing about that was. He's looking at me, I'm looking at him, he's like twice the size of me. And in his head, he's thinking, this bloke's either hard as nails or f***ing mad. <laughs> right, okay. He doesn't know. And I'm playing it cool. Like, hey, mate, want to test it? And he's like, mm, no. So <laughs> it's all about confidence. Sure. So I looked after him. I looked after um, Kate Moss briefly. Oh, I looked yeah. after oh, Kate um, Moss. Okay. Russell Crowe mm. quite a bit. Actually, Russell's nice. awesome. Um, Tom Cruise. I looked after Matt, not Matt Damon, um, Damon Albarn mm -hmm. from the Blur, yeah. One Night and, and his wife. Um, Sir Michael Caine, fantastic. Actually, he was the last guy I looked after, Sir Michael, he was brilliant. Uh, Brad and Angie, yeah. Geez, it's probably the most famous kind of like celebrity bodyguard film of recent years was like the Taken film. It starts off and he's looking Oh, up. Liam Nielsen. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And is, he, is it important to build a rapport with the people? Or Yeah, yeah. it's... People said to me, you know, oh, you've got to see this new bodyguard program. I said, it's the most realistic. I watched it about 10 minutes away and it's a lot of shit. Right. And it's just not real because you, of course you've got to have a report. You can't be all robotic with a curly piece hanging out your ear, stood yeah. there like a yeah. robot. You, you need to know. I need to know exactly everything from my client's underwear sizes to their medical records to what they like, what they mm. don't like. You know, because if they're having a pissed off day, you're having a pissed off day. Mm. And you've got to be able to speak with each other and, and be flexible. And I've got right. to be able to read your moods. You can't do that if you're walking around like a frigging robot and trying mm. too busy looking like sculptured polystyrene, mm -hmm. you know, big arms and all the rest of it. But you've you got to be on a level where you can speak with them. And you've got to be able to speak bluntly with them as well. You know, I would, every one of my clients, if I said, we ain't doing that. We oh, really? We doing it. Yeah. Oh, so you have to be able oh, to yeah. say, it. you're right, okay. Yeah, of course, because otherwise you put yourself in a position that you, for instance, as an example, you know, if my clients want to go to a particular venue, there's a massive overzealous crowd, which they do get overzealous, i.e. the security ain't in place, so there's normally security at these venues. If it ain't in place and it, it's, it's going to spill over and go wild, mm. I ain't going to control it. I mm. can't control 30, 40, 50 people. And I'll be like, that ain't happening. And the client would go, well, we really need to go. I'll go, well, you ain't going. Right. We'll find an alternative. So the and final I'll try call. And find an alternative, right. yeah. And that was the beauty with when I was doing, we had a great mutual understanding. I'm here to provide security. That's what you pay me for. We're not best mates. I am your friend. I am your mate, but I've got a job to do. Right. I'll only get it wrong once. Then I'll look yeah. a right prat, you yeah. know, and you're probably going to end up in a bad position. Yeah. So you, you've got to allow me and listen to me when I say what I want to do. You tell me what you want to do and I'll find an alternative if, if I can. If I can't, that's the way it is. Security comes first. And I, that was me with every single one of them. As I'm speaking to you is how I spoke to all my clients, you know, and do you not to be disrespectful. I'm doing a job. I, I don't, I've, you know, I ain't into this. You're a celebrity. So what? Mm. You're the person who's paying my wages. Mm. And if I, if I ain't working with you, I don't get a wage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And did you, know? did, did you develop any friendships or is it more? No, I had great friendships yeah. with all of them. I'd have a drink with them. I'd laugh, do yeah. stupid 
message you around and all that yeah. sort of stuff. But then there's a line. Yeah, of course. When I'm working, I'm working, uh, you yeah. know. And yeah, and even in the time off, you feel, you know, we'd be in their house having a couple of beers, having a laugh and a joke. I'd still make sure that everything outside was secure and all yes. the rest of it. Yeah. You can never let your hair down. Yeah. And the thing about always that bodyguarding really, world is people too. think it's glamorous. Yeah, we, I got paid well. Yeah, I've traveled a lot. Yeah, I met these cool people, if that's what you're into. But I was working 18 hours a day. Yeah. And they go to bed. I've got two hours work to 18? be done. You couldn't trust the drivers. Couldn't trust anybody else. Why not? Everybody just wants to steal your job. Because the drivers all of a sudden turn into f Sterling Moss stroke evasive driving instructors <laughs> whenever they get in the car because they're trying to impress. Right. Okay. Or they turn up stinking of beer or something else. Or they're, you know, they're too busy. Instead of driving, you know, my clients in the back listen, they're talking and they're like that. Right, right. Okay. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> right. I couldn't trust them. And I used to catch them out all the time. You know, a lot of the drivers would say, okay, tomorrow morning. We're going to go down to Smith's, make sure you're there on time, do a recce, da, da, da. yeah, no problem. Knowing for a while, I ain't going there. Jump in the car, go to turn right at the gate that morning, and I go, no, I'll turn left. But you say we're going to Smith's. No, we're not. We're going to Daly's. They'd be like, Missed And I go, direction. send the next driver. Go down to Smith's, tell me what you see. Drive down to Smith's. Oh, all the paparazzi, paparazzi. are there. Oh, really? Oh, really? You just, you couldn't trust yes. anybody, mate. So no. you had to, constantly having to be one step ahead of the curve to, just to get the day's job done, you know? Because if it all, if they turn up where they're trying to keep a low profile and have a, a, a easy light, and then there's paparazzi, here, they can't be who the, the end of that driver really are. They've got to have this image, like we all have an, an image, like we do for Instagram or wherever it is. You've got to be this person. They can't be themselves. And if it ruins the day, then it ruins your day. So you've just got to Understandable. You know, stay on top of all that. And how, how does it go from that? So uh, am I right in thinking you've got an MBE? Yeah, from, I did, yeah. Okay, so, because I, I, I think that you, correct me if I'm wrong, we'll edit it out, but I think that you were the most decorated officer on the TV show. Yeah, they, they, they love their titles, and they? They put up the most decorated yeah. SAS, highest ranking on TV. I'm not the most decorated. No, 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 the from SAS. the show. From the on show. the show, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I mean, my experience, if you put all the other guys together, I've got more experience than every single one of them put together. Right. Not to say they're not good, they're good at what they do, but I just had the longest survey time. I was fortunate, to, I, was, I think I've been in every conflict other than the Falklands. So how does it come about that you get a call asking if you want to be in a TV show? I don't care. Sorry, I don't want to hear about the TV show, guys. Because mm. that's when he's being tested. There's a mate, we're dead, we ain't getting out of this. And then when you go, I've got to do something, I'm going to find an option. You find an option, it's never a good one, but with perseverance and a little bit of hard work around it, you get through it. And that's what you're looking for in every single person. And that's what you get out of these people. When you look back, you know, yeah. you yeah, you started off as someone who had, like, you know, it could have been that boxing was your yeah. what you were going to do. And then it was parachute regiment. Yeah. Then it was SAS. Then celebrity bodyguarding. And then TV work. Yeah. You know, they're kind of yeah. roots that a lot of people would have as their one thing that they mm. went into. When you look back at that kind of very varied life, yeah. like, what what do you think, it's taught you overall like what's something you've learned across all your experiences honestly honestly god mate to to be grateful and to realize how f fortunate we are mm -hmm. and also to realize there's always somebody worse off than you Facts. 70 percent of Facts. what i do today is charity mm -hmm. giving back i'm not saying this thing, oh you know mm -hmm. great I'm, that's what i do you know putting kids through school because i've been i've been lucky and i've been privileged to be where i am i've i've put myself in some of the most craziest, hardest positions you can imagine. And some of, you know, not through my fault. And I've got through it. And I like to give that back to somebody. The people who give me an opportunity in life, like I said, the old man who I stole from, very influential man, the guy who ran the cadets, another very influential man in my life. Benny, the guy who got killed, just gave, put him in the straight and narrow. My corporal in depot. All these people that gave me Opportunities. I want to, you know, all that experience, that knowledge, give it to somebody else, mm. pass it on to other people, the younger generation, basically. Well, look, Billy, it's been an inspirational and fascinating chat. I mean, oh, and, geez, and the other thing that I always find interesting about people like yourself is that you always start off going like, school wasn't for me, school wasn't for me, I never got on with school, but then you're able to talk so well about all the different complicated yeah like situations and i sometimes wonder with people like you whether you just were at the wrong yeah no nah. that's because he actually went through it he was there you can articulate it when you're there you can articulate cool. it. that's possible mate but i, I know i was a little <laughs> shit, <is it>? I, I, <laughs> thanks so much for coming in mate it's been no, an absolute pleasure 
Thanks, man. Cheers. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Cheers. This is a good watch. I'm not going to lie. You know who Billy looks like? Y'all know uh, Avengers? Um... The, the what's what which one is that guardians of the galaxy you know the blue dude he looks like him this saying military stuff always is gonna draw my attention man so if we got any other like military cool stuff like this man swing it my way <laughs>